Thank you, Father Lopez. And thank you all for coming. It's a great honor to be here. <clears throat> this is going to be a, a heavily literary talk <laughs> in, in what is, I think, not an altogether literary environment. Uh, so I may pause and put in a few explanations that aren't actually in my text as I go along. This first bit has some quotations in it, some of which may sound a little dense, even opaque. Uh, don't worry about that. I don't really understand them myself either, so and uh, not altogether certain anyone does. According to Terry Eagleton, well-known British Marxist literary critic, in bourgeois society, where works of art and even the human capacity for enjoying them have all been commodified by the relentless imperatives of capitalism, and I'm quoting now, the discourse of aesthetics addresses a grievous alienation between sense and spirit, desire and reason, and for Karl Marx, this alienation is rooted in the nature of class society itself. In contrast, according to Eagleton, the perfect future envisioned by Marx amounts to turning everyday human life into the moral equivalent of enjoying a work of art, although not just yet. In Eagleton's words, that final aestheticization of human existence, which we call communism, cannot be prematurely anticipated by a reason which surrenders itself wholly to the ludic the, and poetic, to image and intuition. The vagueness of these asseverations is hardly surprising, since Eagleton was dealing with the difficult matter of tone. This book, including his chapter on the Marxist sublime, was published in 1990, the year after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Three years later, Houston Baker, he is uh, largely known as a professor of black studies at various institutions. The last time I caught up with him, he was at Princeton. Oh, no, sorry, University of Pennsylvania. Three years later, Houston Baker was celebrating the disruptive force of proliferating black studies programs on university campuses with their heavy investment in promoting rap music as art worthy of academic study. Another quotation. Black Studies was committed in the first instance of its determination to undoing all prevalent authentic notions of such disciplines as history and English. Hence, at the site of the university, Black Studies presented a hugely unsettling challenge for even as it sought in its own voice to lay claim to disciplinary status as a normal academic subject, its very conjunctive and stylistically diverse energies eradicated the referential lines of both subjectivity and disciplined academic knowledge. Or, as Baker subsequently phrases it, blacks were, quote, anything other than grateful for such an opportunity and disappointed the assumption that they would swear allegiance to Western civilization. I think the last bit somewhat explains the first bit, which was a one of those dense passages. Although Baker may have been disappointed when it was Bob Dylan and not, say, Jay-Z or Public Enemy who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, both Baker and Eagleton must have taken some satisfaction in the bestowal of the award on the purveyor of adorable variety of upscale popular music. For what Baker and Eagleton have in common is a long-term project of deconstructing the hierarchical cultural distinctions of Western civilization. The failure of Marxist economics and governing strategies exemplified in the raising of the Berlin Wall and the subsequent dissolution of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, as well as a subversion of Orthodox Chinese communism by capitalist economics, may have made Marx's theories seem passe. Nevertheless, these political developments may be less significant than the triumph of what is now called cultural Marxism, which happily absorbs the tactics of corporate investment and acquisition 
while gnawing away at the moral, religious, and artistic roots of Western Christian civilization, and thus engendering the wasteland in which literature now withers. Over the past half century, professors of literature, denizens of English departments such as Terry Eagleton and Houston Baker, who are altogether typical, have deliberately set about dismantling the process by which students acquire the knowledge and experience necessary to read works of literature with competence and even pleasure. They have been active participants in what the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci termed the long march through the institutions. The ideological program of the Frankfurt School is much the same and has been even more influential. All these men concluded that the overturning of the bourgeois social order could be far more readily affected by changing the culture than by changing economics. Or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that the purpose of changing economics was to change the culture all along. The goal has always been the establishment of an egalitarian society of complete liberation from any restraint on the satisfaction of any desire so that man's sense of alienation could be altogether eliminated. The deliquescence of the concept of literature and of the other arts has a devastating effect on education and on the health of our culture as a whole because it renders nugatory the concept of the integrity of the work of literature or any other work of art as a thing in itself with at least an intentional being. Although it is doubtful whether Terry Eagleton wholly shares Houston Baker's enthusiasm for rap, the two men are both ideologues and hence share the conviction that literature, like all art, must be harnessed to serve the ends of political power. If works of art are no longer distinct creations with internal generic rules and criteria of excellence, then the concept of disinterest is compromised and the motive of intellectual and imaginative contemplation undertaken for its own sake perishes, leaving the liberal arts and liberal education to languish. Literature is not a means of conveying information, facts, or propositions. And it is not a means of winning an argument or convincing an audience of a proposition. Poetry is not rhetoric. It is rather a representation, in the Greek of Plato and Aristotle, a mimesis of reality, or better, of the human experience of reality. As a result, any story, play, poem, of genuine literary substance is necessarily paradoxical. After all, writes William Lynch, the task of real thought and of the imagination, too, is to organize the diversity of reality in unity, but in such a way that the diversity, which is a fact, still remains. This means that literature must be both abstract and concrete, both general and particular. The former terms it shares with philosophical discourse, the latter with immediate lived experience. Literature also manifests what may be called an analogical, if not equivocal, relation to propositional truth. In The Republic, Socrates accuses poets of lying, but Sir Philip Sidney, writing about two millennia later, counters, now for the poet, you can see right away this isn't my English, now for the poet he nothing affirms and therefore never lieth, for as I take it, to lie is to affirm that to be true which is false. So as the other artist and especially the historian affirming many things can in the cloudy knowledge of mankind hardly escape from many lies, but the poet, as I said before, never affirmeth the poet therefore never maketh any circles about your imagination to conjure you to believe for true what he writes, and therefore he cannot lie. Sidney is thus among the first to attempt to distinguish between falsehood and fiction, hence to complain that Shakespeare misrepresents the historical Prince Hal and Hotspur as to their ages and their non-existent single combat on the battlefield at Shrewsbury is to treat a history play as actual history. Such a critique is a category error. 
And yet, and yet we do expect good literature to be true in some sense of the word. We expect the characters in a fiction to be recognizable as men and women with plausible traits and motives. And we are disappointed if the plot, the events of a novel's or a play's action is not consistent with the characters who act and suffer them. We are, in other words, willing to accept Tolkien's hobbits, dwarfs, and elves so long as they and other rational creatures in the tale speak, act, and respond in accord with our experience of human and rational nature. What we reject are contrived plots, brittle, affected dialogue, and shallow, inconsistent, artificial characters. We are then looking not for factual or physical reality, but rather for an image of moral and spiritual reality. And it is this which nurtures our imaginations and enhances our understanding of the world of experience that we inhabit. Literature does so not by expounding a thesis about human life, but by dramatizing a series of events in a mimesis of the experience of men and women that we find compelling and therefore enlightening. It enables us to step outside our own particular situation and to contemplate life in a way that is both imaginatively and emotionally engaging and yet also disinterested. Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited provide, I should mention I, I chose this novel because I was hoping at least some, some people in this audience may have read it or at least seen the, the uh, very good series of uh, video series that was put on the BBC, by the BBC a number of, well, decades ago now. But it's, it's around on, on cable TV. Okay, Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited provides an effective, though challenging, illustration of the literary illumination of the moral imagination. The challenge is to refute the most severe critiques of the novel, which insist either that Waugh is merely preaching, the work, that, the work is a Catholic tract, though of dubious orthodoxy, or that is a subjective projection of the author's peculiar quirks, his sentimentality, nostalgia, and above all, his snobbery, that's the usual accusation, or some combination thereof. Ironically, reviewers of the novel, men of letters in an era largely innocent of what is now called theory, anticipate the academic abuse of literature pervasive in our time. They do so by neglecting to consider the novel as an integral artistic whole and regarding it instead as a statement of the author's religious beliefs or an expression of what they take to be his character. Waugh is treated as a popular celebrity, like Bob Dylan say, rather than as a serious novelist. Although an apologia for Brideshead Revisited is an element in my argument, I am finally more concerned with pointing out how its misinterpretation exemplifies an inadequate approach to literature and, most important, with suggesting a manner of reading that reveals the positive contribution that literature can make to cultural awareness and moral formation. I want to suggest, in fact, that uh, much of the postmodernist theorizing that so many people find so dismaying nowadays, which seems to be based on rather uh, esoteric theories of uh, political and economic and sociological kind, actually they're not so different from the kind of purely personal gossipy sort of uh, Bell Lettres literary theorizing, or not theorizing, but reviewing that went on in the 30s and 40s when Law's novels were mostly coming out. Uh, bear with me now. A brief summary of the plot of Brideshead Revisited will provide at least a rudimentary context. Note first that the novel is very carefully structured. That's partly how we know it's a novel and not an actual tract of life. He's, he's made it into a very tightly, construct, tightly organized, uh, formal shape. 
The main action of the novel is framed by a very brief prologue and epilogue where we meet Charles Ryder as a captain in the British Army in the middle of World War II. After a night of traveling with his company under blackout conditions, at dawn he finds himself at a great country house, Brideshead Manor, which has been requisitioned for billeting troops. At the end of the prologue, a subaltern, a certain Lieutenant Hooper, astonished by how ornate the place is and by a frightful great fountain, says, you never saw such a thing. Yes, Hooper, I did, Charles replies. I've been here before. The epilogue returns to this time and setting and offers Charles's experience, final reflections on his experience. The 300 plus pages between this very brief prologue and epilogue tell how Charles came to Brideshead for the first time in the early 1920s and the part of the great estate and the noble flight family who dwelt there played in his life. Book one, Et in Arcadia Ego, is largely concerned with Charles's friendship with the younger son, Sebastian Flight, whom he meets at Oxford and with whom it is not too much to say he falls in love. Although the two young men undoubtedly enter into a homoerotic relationship, the details are kept discreetly vague. Sebastian wishes to keep Charles away from his family, consisting of his older brother Brideshead or Bridie, two younger sisters, Julia and Cordelia, and especially from his mother, Lady Marchmain, whose husband has abandoned her and gone into voluntary exile with a mistress. Lady Marchmain is a devout Catholic. Lord Marchmain converted upon marrying her, though it didn't stick. And her older and younger brother, I'm sorry, her older son and younger daughter are both quite pious, but also socially inept. Julia and Sebastian are both quite attractive, but increasingly negligent in the practice of their faith. Book one is largely an account of how the ominous overtones of its title are realized. The phrase, et in Arcadia ego, I too was in Arcadia, is most commonly associated with the famous painting by Nicolas Poussin, which depicts a group of classically attired shepherds gazing at a tomb marked by this same inscription, et in Arcadia ego. Uh, when he is at Oxford, Charles acquires a human skull with the same inscription on its forehead as an adornment for his rooms. He was a typical undergraduate in some ways. The Arcadia of irresponsible self-indulgent at Oxford and Brideshead Manor predictably, predictably collapses. Death is also in Arcadia. Death is usually considered to be the I who is in Arcadia or else the dead man in the tomb. Uh, if you're interested, there is a brilliant essay on this theme by Erwin Panofsky, uh, which I heartily recommend to you. Book one ends with Sebastian seemingly a hopeless dipsomaniac. Some of you seem young enough not to know what that means. Nowadays, we'd say someone who indulges in substance abuse, mainly alcohol. Book one ends with Sebastian, seemingly a hopeless dipsomaniac, living with a deserter from the German army in Morocco. Julia has married a divorced man in a Protestant ceremony, and Lady Marchmain has died. Charles, however, has been commissioned by the older brother to paint Marchmain House. That's the family's London home. As Bridie, the older brother, explains, you know it's being pulled down. My father is selling it. They're going to put up a block of flats here. They're keeping the name. We can't stop them, apparently. Charles's first commission, what sets him on his course of fame and fortune as an architectural painter, is ironically the result of an act of destruction, though of course we call it development nowadays. What is ironic about this is that this kind of thing, the tearing down of these houses, he in other words makes his living painting houses, the tearing down of which he thinks is a terrible thing and emblematic of the decline of English culture and society. This is worth noticing that Charles makes his living 
painting houses that are probably going to be torn down and replaced by, well, you know what, they're going to be replaced by. Drive through the outskirts of London and look at those flats and, and weep. Book two, A Twitch Upon the Thread. Some of you may recognize that phrase from a Chesterton short story. It comes up in the, in the course of the novel. This book begins with what appears to be a romantically satisfying and in secular terms successful outcome for Charles and Julia. The action has moved from the 1920s to the later 1930s. Charles Ryder, now a prosperous, prominent painter, has sought to expand his artistic repertoire by a journey in South America to produce a series of paintings on ancient ruins in the jungle among the savages. There's, of course, irony in this. The savages in the jungle are not especially more savage than the savages in the jungle of contemporary London, as he sees it. He meets Julia on an ocean liner returning to Europe, and while most of the passengers are suffering seasickness during a storm, the two of them engage in an adulterous sexual affair. I suppose that's one of the advantages of not succumbing to seasickness. You can get away with all kinds of mischief while everyone else is under the weather. They both set about divorcing their equally unfaithful spouses in order to marry one another. For Charles, the culmination of his good fortune comes in the prospect of being master of Brideshead Manor. Lord Marchmain, disgusted by his eldest son's marriage to the middle-class widow of a naval officer, has changed his will and left the country estate to Julia. I should mention that Brideshead, the older brother, has met the widow through a common interest in collecting matchboxes. Uh, Law is often accused of having a snobbish love for the grandeur of the British nobility. If Bridey is any uh, example, he hardly portrays him as a man of great sophistication uh, to be emulated. The other shoe drops. But all these hopes of worldly satisfaction come to naught. Gravely ill, Lord Marchmain returns to England in the foreboding summer of 1939 in order to die in his ancestral home. As he declines toward death, Bridie and to Charles's dismay and astonishment, Julia insists that the local parish priest be summoned to administer last rites. Lord Marchmain, who has not only refused for years to practice the religion of the wife he came to hate, but has expressed open hostility to it, is at first recalcitrant. On his deathbed, however, at the urging of Father Mackay, who has anointed him, the proud old noble makes the sign of the cross, apparently acknowledging his sins and asking for forgiveness. Julia, who has already been increasingly anxious and testy with Charles, is deeply moved by the miracle of grace. It is the twitch on the thread by which God draws her back into his grace and the communion of the church. Even before she tells him, Charles realizes that there will be no marriage, that his dream of earthly happiness with Julia in Brideshead in the Brideshead Arcadia that has so entranced him as an Oxford student will not be fulfilled. What is hinted in the prologue becomes explicit in the epilogue. Charles, moved in a way he could not have imagined by the destiny of the flight family, has also converted to Catholicism. As the novel ends, he visits the Art Nouveau Chapel. Uh, this was a gift of Lord Marchmain to his wife upon their marriage. Uh, Charles regards it as the only ugly part of the house. He visits the Art Nouveau chapel, which has been reconsecrated for use of the troops quartered at Brideshead after having been closed down upon the death of Lady Marchmain. Ironically, this architecturally ill-conceived addition is the only part of the house that, quote, showed no ill effects of long neglect or the depredation of the army's expropriation. Charles says, a prayer, an ancient, newly learned form of words before a small red flame, a beaten copper lamp of deplorable design, <laughs> relit before the beaten copper doors of the tabernacle. This bare summary gives no sense of Waugh's luminous style. Everybody agrees he's one of the greatest stylists of the 20th century. 
enhanced in this book by a certain lushness in keeping with the Arcadian theme, or of his sharply drawn characters, resonant dialogue, or compellingly memorable scenes. Indeed, it hardly does justice to the subtly arranged plot. It should nonetheless indicate that the novel's clearly conceived formal structure establishes by itself, almost, the book's meaning, its vision of life, almost by itself. In book one, Charles is consumed by an intense but unnatural love for Sebastian. In book two, this youthful infatuation is displaced by an adulterous passion for Julia. Both flight children become images of his fascination with what Charles takes to be the mystery and refinement embodied in the country house at Brideshead. The framing device of prologue and epilogue, however, offer us a humbled Captain Charles Ryder who has lost everything except the one thing that matters. He has reluctantly learned that what he was really seeking in the resplendent atmosphere of Brideshead was the grace provided by the sacramental presence of Christ, signaled by the lamp of deplorable design on the altar. It is regrettable that so many reviewers and subsequent commentators as well have failed to see the import of the novel so manifest in the shape of its plot. Some of the original reviews are simply uncomprehending. Writing in the Manchester Guardian, J.D. Beresford observes, quote, Mr. Waugh's principal themes are adultery, perversion, and drunkenness. And while I could not fail to admire the brilliance of his write writing, I greatly disliked his story. One might, by the same token, complain that the principal themes of Othello are racial prejudice, sex, and domestic violence. Both remarks are accurate so far as they go, but they leave out a good deal. The unsigned TOS review says that the novel's, quote, comedy is always engulfed in the author's asseveration of Catholic doctrine and goes on to characterize Waugh as very much the Catholic apologist and romantically conservative preacher. That one must have drawn a smile from him. While Henry Re Reed, the reviewer for The New Statesman, ascribes Waugh's faults, which recur constantly, he says, to an overpowering snobbishness. In what is perhaps the most famous early account of Brideshead Revisited, Edmund Wilson in The New Yorker calls the novel, novel a bitter blow to this reviewer. An admirer of the early novels, Wilson finds that Waugh's snobbery, hitherto held in check by his satirical point of view, has here emerged shameless and rampant. And although his cult of the high nobility is allowed to become so rapturous and solemn that it finally gives the impression of being the only real religion in the book, yet the novel is a Catholic tract, end of quote. Nevertheless, the reviewer goes on, unsympathetic by conviction with the point of view of Catholic converts, still he finds it impossible to feel that the author has conveyed in all of this any genuine religious experience. I don't know how he thinks he would know. Uh, I could go on, and we shall have occasion to advert to specific critical observations at a later stage in this discussion. What matters, however, is to determine why the reviewers and many subsequent interpreters have not satisfactorily engaged the artistic import of Brideshead Revisited. To understand the flawed, if often tacit, assumptions from which such errors emerge it is, often, is often the best way to devise a sounder basis for literary interpretation. Improbable as it may seem, the gossipy personality cult approach of the initial reviewers shares with the contemporary theorists, be they Marxists, cultural materialists, or devotees of some other species of ism, the principle that the significance of a literary work rests not on the actual texts, but rather on the individual quirks and predilections of the author or, for the contemporary theorist, the ideological constraints of his race, class, and gender. In the case of a critic like Edmund Wilson, who was very taken with Marxism in the 30s, these two approaches coalesce. The temptation to read the novel as barely veiled autobiography, whatever interest it may hold for the cultural historian, as well as the merely curious, is at best tangential to an assessment of Waugh's novel as a work of fiction. Let us begin with the accusation of snobbery. 
which according to many hostile critics ruins Bride's Head and much of Waugh's subsequent writing. Waugh answered the charge in an essay for Life magazine in 1946. Class consciousness, he says, particularly in England, has been so much in flame nowadays that to mention a nobleman is like mentioning a prostitute 60 years ago. The new prudes say, no doubt such people do exist, but we would sooner not hear about them. I reserve the right, Law says, to deal with the kind of people I know best. Even supposing that the accusation of snobbery is true, that the man Evelyn Waugh was one in fact, it is irrelevant to the quality of the fiction that the author has made out of the material that he knows best. And this is an important point. Obviously, authors write out of their own experience. But that doesn't mean knowing the autobiography of the author, his life, is a key to what the fiction actually means. In a classic essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, T.S. Eliot, like Waugh, concedes that a writer creates out art out of his own experience. But, Eliot says, and I'm quoting, the more perfect the artist, the more perfect, more completely separate in him will be the man who suffer, suffers and the mind which creates. And he continues, the difference between art and the event is always absolute. One Henry IV is not an historical account of the Battle of Shrewsbury, and you don't evaluate it on how closely it matches it. <laughs> the author's alleged snobbery, then, is only significant from a literary perspective if it leads him to express his lamentable feelings at the expense of devising a convincing depiction of his characters and the plot in which they are involved. If, that is, the book moves the reader to share the author's deplorable attitude and indulge the attendant feelings at the expense of the plausibility of the action. There is, in any case, a good deal of evidence to the contrary regarding Waugh's character, a point made at some length by any number of his biographers. Um, I can let you know who they are in question and answer if you want to. There are probably too many of them, and those biographies are too long. I know I've slogged through them all. Uh, but the charge is finally a distraction from the actual work of literary criticism. It's really a lot easier to run down the facts of a man's life than to interpret a novel. It is difficult to see how Brideshead Revisited would induce a competent reader to worship the nobility or to see the Catholic faith through a haze of romantic medieval nostalgia. Charles Ryder, the first person narrator, does in fact move into a socially more elevated world as a result of his friendship with the younger son of a peer. And he is certainly captivated by his friend Sebastian Flight and eventually by other members of his family and by the atmosphere, not so much of luxury, but of refinement in which they dwell. Every member of the family, however, is presented as filled with flaws. That is, they are depicted as sinners a point that Charles will only grasp much later. Neither their wealth nor their social status brings them happiness, and their Catholicism is hardly glamorized. Indeed, Waugh himself reports receiving a dismaying letter from a reader, an American reader, who says, quote, your bride's head revisited is a strange way to show that Catholicism is the answer to anything. Seems more like the kiss of death. <laughs> Sebastian's father, Lord Marchmain, has not only abandoned his wife and his religion, but also his responsibility as a peer of the realm by living in an Italian idol, his version of Arcadia, with a mistress. Two of his children, Sebastian and Julia, become increasingly estranged from the church in the course of the novel, living in defiance of her teachings. The good Catholics in the family Lady Marchmain and her older son and younger daughter, Bridie and Cordelia, are faithful but inept in recommending their fidelity, either to the fallen away members of the family or to Charles. Cordelia is surely the most level-headed, she's the younger daughter, and congenial of the trio, but is the youngest child who is quirky and unlike her sister, not physically attractive, she tends to be discounted. Lady Marchmain's good intentions are marred by excessive maternal interference with her children and effusive piety, which becomes suffocating. 
She is not as bad, by the way, as she is depicted by Emma Thompson in a recent film version of the novel. Uh, Emma Thompson plays her as if she were Lady Macbeth <laughs> or, or Claire from House of Cards. Uh, <laughs> Lady Marchmain has her faults, but not, not that bad. Her good intentions are marred by, oh, I said that already, sorry. She is sufficiently gullible to be taken in by the academic charlatan, Mr. Samgrass, who makes a very good thing out of monitoring the increasingly drunken Sebastian for a while and traipsing all over Europe with him. And her effort to enlist Charles in her project, in other words, to make a spy out of him, sort of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to Sebastian's Hamlet, reveals an astounding ignorance of the psychology of young men. Bridie's disengaged lack of sympathy for ordinary human foibles seems a parody of scholastic logic, and at times he is almost a derisory figure. Uh, when Juliet and her first husband, Rex, uh, are unwrapping the wedding gifts in advance of the wedding and making mostly negative comments about them, uh, Bridie marches in and says, well, not going to be any wedding. Sorry, too bad. I found out this guy's been married before. And of course, just sort of, it's as if he'd come in and poured cold water over. He, he doesn't have a lot of tact, let's say, and leave it at that. Hostile critics also suggest that Brideshead revisited events as little. Anyway, he's not Brideshead. As I say, someone who suggests that Waugh thinks that all nobles are brilliantly refined and sophisticated people. Hostile critics also suggest that Brideshead revisited events as a lack of charity in Waugh's Catholicism. Rose Macaulay complains, quote, Mr. Waugh seems to equate the divine purpose, the tremendous fact of God at work in the universe, with obedient membership of a church. The human spirit, if redeemed, must loyally conform to this church and its rules, unquote. One is tempted to retort that our Lord is also keen on obedience. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. But it is more pertinent here to observe that what the novel actually shows is the working of God's grace, of his relentless mercy, seeking out the most disobedient sinners in the most improbable places. Donat O'Donnell, actually a pseudonym for Connor Cruz O'Brien, is even harsher than Macaulay. Argu um, Macaulay mainly says that Wa well, may be religious, but he's not very spiritual, I think she'd say if she were around now. Uh, O'Brien argues that snobbery and lack of genuine Christian charity are linked, both aspects of the author's vulgarity and moral failure. The Catholicism of Mr. Waugh and of certain other English converts is hardly separable from a personal romanticism and class loyalty. Is Lord Marchmain's soul more valuable than Hooper's? You remember Hooper. Uh, you never saw such a place, that Hooper. To say so in so many words, O'Brien continues, that it was would be heresy, but Brideshead Revisited almost seems to imply that the wretched Hooper has no soul at all, certainly nothing to compare with the genuine old landed article. End of quote. It is difficult to imagine a more egregious instance of critical bias. The wretched Hooper is a minor character who appears only in the prologue and epilogue of the novel. To raise the issue of his conversion, would he be moved by Charles's newly acquired piety and begin making inquiries at the local parish? To do so could only be an absurd contrivance that would distort the structure of the narrative and compromise its probability. Charles Ryder is rather hard on Hooper. In the weeks that we were together, this is Ryder, the narrator now, Hooper became a symbol to me of young England, so that whenever I read some public utterance proclaiming what youth demanded in the future and what the world owed to youth, I would test these general statements by substituting Hooper and seeing if they, were, if they still seem plausible. Thus, in the dark hour before Reveille, I sometimes pondered Hooper rallies, <laughs> Hooper hostels, international Hooper cooperation, and the religion of Hooper. He was the acid test of all these alloys. These sardonic reflections are, however, aimed at least as much at progressive politicians and pundits as they are at Hooper. And if Charles finds him less than an admirable specimen of young England, he treats him with more respect than the company commander 
a man of Hooper's own class, who publicly humiliates him. It seems the case that in the second part, in the epilogue, Charles softens his attitude towards Hooper, uh, growing more patient with his sub subaltern's ineptitude and vulgarity. As for was anxious interest in Lord Marchmain's soul, that's Connor Cruz O'Brien's phrase, it is by no means the central focus of Brideshead. In any reasonable account of the novel, Lord Marchmain is a secondary character, and the fate of his soul is not a principal theme. The first-person narrator, Charles Ryder, is at the center of the novel from the beginning to the end, and it is his destiny that fully exemplifies Waugh's stated purpose in the novel and attempt to trace the workings of divine purpose in a pagan world. We simply do not know could not possibly know whether Lord Marchmain is in a state of grace as he dies. We don't know. He makes the sign of the cross, barely conscious. His daughters, his son Brideshead, and even his mistress Cara are relieved and grateful for this indication that the dying man has expressed contrition for his sins, and Father McKay calls it a beautiful thing to see. Father McKay is an Irish priest who fits rather uncomfortably in, in the setting of Bride's Head. Nevertheless, his remark to Charles, he's no fool, by the way, is afterward is revealing. You're not a Catholic, I think, Mr. Ryder, but at least you'll be glad for the ladies to have the comfort of it. He knows what he's dealing with here, too. There are grounds for hope, but not for certainty. Perhaps the dying nobleman was touched by grace, Perhaps he made his gesture in a semi-conscious state out of politeness or fear or mere habit. We can hope. We don't know. Owing to the convention of the first-person narrator, however, we do know what Lord Marchmain's gesture meant for Charles because we are privy to his thoughts. Then I knew that the sign, Lord Marchmain's sign of the cross, was not a little thing, not a passing nod of recognition, and a phrase came back to me from childhood of the veil of the temple being rent from top to bottom. At first, Charles is stunned by the sudden realization that he has lost all his worldly prospects, which had meant so much to him. Life in an elegant manor house, well stocked with fine wines, set in a luxuriant park in the company of a beautiful woman whom he loves and access to a circle of sophisticated friends. What's not to like, as we say nowadays? But the epilogue reveals that Charles has come to see beyond these truly valuable but ephemeral goods to the one permanent, ultimate good that is the answer to all our longings the presence of Christ in the sacrament, which is the fundamental truth of Catholicism. With rueful humor, Charles tells Hooper, I'm homeless, childless, middle-aged, loveless. Neither Charles nor the flight children are happy in an earthly sense as the novel closes. They're all being run all over the place by the war, among other things. The house is obviously doomed. But they have all acknowledged that earthly contentment must be sacrificed for what is greater. I should mention, I didn't mention it in my summary, Sebastian is sort of taken up as a hanger-on at a monastery in, in Morocco where he occasionally runs off and gets drunk again but largely hangs out taking care of things and serving as a sort of doorman and whatnot. They all, okay. Brideshead Revisited cannot be accused of evangelizing for the religion of the aristocracy but it also does not evangelize in the strict sense for the Catholic faith. Nevertheless, it does offer what a work of literature can amidst our moral and spiritual wasteland, a dramatic image of grace at work in the lives of typical Catholics, sinful, negligent, in flight, to take note of the pun on the surname flight, from the demands our Lord makes on his disciples. There is very little discussion of doctrine in the book, and it is usually shallow and desultory. Much of it consists of trying to catechize Rex Mottram when he's going to marry Julia to very little effect. Uh, doesn't, it's, he's, he's a difficult convert, uh, the priest who's working on him says. Uh, he just agrees with everything. 
just tell me what to believe, Father, and I'll do it. Uh, there's very little discussion. Uh, but of course, a novel is not an appropriate means of expounding and defending Catholic teaching. For that, you turn to Augustine, Aquinas, Newman, or papal encyclicals. But for a compelling depiction of the lived experience of Catholicism, you read Dante, or Crashaw, or Gerard Manley Hopkins, or Evelyn Waugh. Not every preacher is effective with every congregation, of course. There is probably more than one reader who will find Catholicism as Waugh presents it to be the kiss of death. But many will find deeply moving its account of a man of no particular virtue or spirituality who covets the fine things of this world with an intense desire only to realize finally that there is only one pearl of great price for which one must sell all he has. In closing, I wish to take note of how Brideshead has, well, it's always uh, going to be a fine novel, but it has, a, I think, in our current atmosphere, our current time, uh, 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 quite pertinent, it's become, again, quite pertinent to specific issues of interest to the church. The way that Charles and Sebastian are drawn to what is almost undoubtedly a sodomite relationship and presumably succumb to the temptation, this seems to be uh, the implication of the novel. Uh, Charles says that uh, we, we committed sins high in the list of, of mortal sins. And presumably it seems to be based on Waugh's own experience, or at least that of men he knew. It is worth noticing that the novel, that in the novel, homoerotic liaisons are not a political issue. They are just sins, a temptation that will affect different men in different ways. They're no different from other kinds of sins, and men succumb to them, some more than others, some don't. Uh, all of us have our own crosses to bear. The treatment of divorce and remarriage is even more striking, since it is an element in the climax of both books one and two. In the first, Julia and her husband Rex Matram ignore the church's refusal to sanction their marriage, but it brings them little worldly satisfaction and no real happiness at all. In the second, Julia and Charles almost surely could have forged some kind of temporal contentment had they married since their affection for and knowledge of one another was genuine. They probably could have made what would have looked like a pretty good marriage in earthly eyes. But Julia and subsequently Charles realized that such happiness would be the end of true joy and of spiritual peace. I should mention that when Julia tells Charles, I'm sorry, I can't do this, she says, I know I'm not a very good Catholic, and I know I'm probably going to, as she puts it, be bad again. She means sin, of course, but I can't take this final step that would estrange me forever. Uh, again, it's it's not like she's, there's nothing sentimental or, or there's no sense that it's, you snap your fingers and all the problems are solved. A novel is not, yeah, I'm sorry, a novel is an account of particular imagined characters in specific situations. It offers no general definitive judgments. What it provides is a concrete exemplum a material image to aid us in focusing our rational deliberations. If Brideshead Revisited succeeds in presenting an image of spiritual struggle for our contemplation, then it is a worthy piece of fiction and offers hope for literary edification in the midst of our present wasteland. Thank you. As Father Lopez said, I'm happy to consider questions, should you have any. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, wait wait for the microphone, otherwise people won't hear you well. Yeah. Here. Go ahead. Except for the chapel, if you want to get truth, 
the, the deplorable land, Cordelia and Bridie are both repeatedly described as ugly. So it almost seems like it's an either or. That's really a very good question. And uh, what I would say to that is that you need to remember that this is a novel. That it's about. Do you want me to speak? Yes. Could you not hear me over there? Okay, I'll get back to this. Sorry. Did you all hear the question? Yes. Okay. Um, you have to remember that this is a novel. It's not giving you a general statement of the relationship between truth and beauty, which, along with being. Uh, are, are, of course, uh, in a sense, facets of the same thing. Uh, it, what it is saying is that in some instances, one must be ready to sacrifice earthly beauty because all the beauty that they're dealing with here is, is temporal. It's ephemeral. It's things of this earth for ultimate transcendent truth. It's interesting you mention that because most of the original critics and, and many subsequent uh, critiques of the novel have, made the, have, have tried to argue that, well, was just fascinated by this beautiful house, these beautiful people, his religion. I mean, the, the religion of the aristocracy, Edmund Wilson goes after him about that, uh, Connor Cruz O'Brien. Uh, which your question suggests is nonsensical, <laughs> and I agree, I think you're right. Uh, what he's saying is that, but, but that doesn't mean they're bad things. The beauty he gives up, I mean, Julia's beauty is beautiful. Uh, the bride's head manner is a beautiful thing. It's not going to last forever. Someday it's going to be a heap of rubble, sooner or later. It looks like sooner, uh, the way the end of the novel goes. Uh, but what it does, of course, for us in this world is it gives us an image, an inkling of that greater transcendent beauty beyond. But it also reminds us, and that's what the conclusion is about, is that any beauty in this world, though it may image the beauty beyond us, can't take its place. That's idolatry. Uh, the business about the chapel and, the, and the, 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 <laughs> the altar lamp of deplorable design, he can't stop saying that. I mean, this is in Charles's mind. And the irony is, is deliberate, of course, because it brings us up short. I mean, he's obviously thinking rather, especially at the end, thinking rather ruefully himself. Here I am, Charles Ryder, the man of extraordinarily refined tastes, who... Uh, knows the difference between what's well-made and what isn't, what fits and what doesn't, and yet here I am kneeling here because this thing that it is represented here is more important no matter what the, uh, the signal looks like. Does, does that answer your question? The gentleman in the back had a question, I think. Oh, we've got a microphone. Excellent. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I had a question about the um, the essay to which you referred by Eliot. Um, uh -huh. Tradition and the Individual yeah, Talent. Um, Eliot says that there has to be this absolute division between the um, personality, um, broadly stated, of the author and the work which they produce. Um, but I I was wondering, because we also find that literary making is imitation of reality, mm -hmm. and in that image that um, Lynch gives, um, it's both concrete and universal at mm -hmm. once. At once. Um, and those things must obviously come from somewhere um, and are obviously inflected by um, well, it, that's messy, but, um, you know, are an image of the reality which the author himself wants to give imitation of um, and the human actions which he sees are true. Um, like, how, like, how is it that the author completely removes himself from the um, process of making while 
providing the work with what has a universal content. He doesn't. I, I, I want to make a distinction. I'll make a couple of distinctions here. First, I want to draw a distinction between the process of making and the object made. And there's a sense in which, of course, we can say, oh, yes, you can see the author is in this work. Uh, I had an example of it this morning. We, we stole away and went to the uh, National Gallery where they have that wonderful uh, traveling exhibit, which I heartily recommend to everyone, of Vermeer and the genre painters of the Dutch 17th century. And when my wife and I were going through it, we were struck by the fact you walked into a gallery room and immediately you could pick out, that, that I should explain that they have arranged the exhibit by uh, themes. So you've got several paintings of ladies making lace by different painters and then several paintings of astronomers and so, so in each room. You walk in the room, immediately we, we knew which one was the Vermeer before we got closer, saw it. It just had him written all over it. So you can say, well, my goodness, that's, that's Vermeer. But that doesn't tell us a thing about the actual Vermeer. It tells us about Vermeer the artist, not Vermeer the husband, father, debtor, creditor, <laughs> guy who you know went down to the local pub and, and had a pint. I, what it tells us about is him as an artist. I would make that distinction first, and I think that's what Eliot is talking about. The difference, of course, well, not the difference. It's clear that in some of those paintings of Ivor Vermeer, he's, he's using the same room, probably one of his. And yet the fact that it gives us an accurate or inaccurate depiction of the actual room in which he did it is finally irrelevant to the value of the painting. Um, we don't know a great deal about Homer, you know, <laughs> whether he was a snob or not, or uh, how, <laughs> how true he was to Athena, or uh, which, which faction he was siding with in Mycenae, or wherever he was. Well, how many cities claim Homer? I forgot. I mean, we don't know a thing. And I use Homer as, in a sense, as my example for the, the literary artist. Uh, the work's there, no matter what we know about him. Now, I would also draw a further point, and I'm going to go out on a limb here in this setting, because I'm going to try to make an analogy involving analogy. Uh, in theology, when you, when you talk about God, you almost always use analogies. Am I right there? I hope. Please. <laughs> Hope so. Uh, <laughs> and my understanding is that, of course, the difference bet between the thing we compare God to and God is absolute. It's even more absolute than the difference between the poet and the poem that Eliot is talking about. There is a kind of analogy, which, again, I feel as though I'm treading on very thin ice here, uh, between, <laughs> between a man who writes a novel or a play or, or a poem and God. Sidney uses it, Tolkien uses it in his essay on fairy stories. They're both creating a kind of world. And we know, in a sense, that when you read a work of fiction, a, a, an epic poem, a, a work of fantasy, if you want to call it like that, like The Lord of the Rings, uh, it's about something. It's about our lives. It's about the world in, in some sense or other, but it's about the world by being a different world. It's in a sense like looking at a picture of yourself. You can only see yourself by not, you can't look at yourself. And so you have a work of art, be it a painting or, or a novel or an epic poem. Uh, you look at life by not looking at life because when you're run, leading your life, you have a stake in it. This, to me, is the, the comparison I was trying to make between the reviewers in London in 1945 who were reviewing this book and were saying, who's he talking about here? Who does that sound? Oh, that's why he's such a snob. Oh, that's why. Did you hear you know, how, what he did this? But, oh, his Catholicism. He's no good. Look at that man. Has nothing to do with the novel. Um, Maybe he was a rotten guy. Most novelists are. Actually, Wallach's pretty good compared to, say, Hemingway or Norman Mailer. I, you know, what? Uh, it, uh, so th what I'm trying to say about the difference is it's not that we can't say, ah, yes, this is a Vermeer. This is a novel by Waugh. Nobody else could have written this. But that the wielder of that style, that craftsman, 
uh, Maritain's book, Art and Scholasticism, I think makes a wonderful point about the, the literary and the, the graphic artist as, as a craftsman first off, before someone imaginative. So I think that, that distinction is a very, does that answer your question? I, probably more than, more than you needed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, how uh, th this ideological hermeneutic can affect writing as well. Of, uh, I, if we don't treat the text as primary and emphasize close reading before other contextual issues, uh, do you think that's also problematic uh, for Catholics now as writers? Or to rephrase that, if, uh, in order to be a good Catholic writer, do you need to put the text first? Uh, I well, I think I'm treading on even thinner ice now, so I'm going to, to kind of shuffle off and, and let Flannery O'Connor answer that. Um, <laughs> she, she has an essay in which she points, she has a very really interesting essay about the relationship between a Catholic novelist and the church. And this was back in the days when there was an index of prohibited books. Uh, you know, the only reason they stopped that was because it just got too long. They could, it was, <laughs> it's, it's like the Shakespeare Association doesn't publish a bi biography anymore. There's too much, you can't, same thing. There's too many books that need to be prohibited. But she said, really, the index is a great thing for a writer. This means I can do my job as a novelist creating a novel and let the church worry about if it's gonna have a bad effect on the faithful because it's easy enough to imagine different kinds of work that are going to affect different people differently. There's some sense in suggesting that not all works of literature are appropriate for all readers. I, so, the Catholic, but O'Connor also says, and I think almost all the modern Catholic novelists that I know of, Waugh, Green, O'Connor, they all said, I'm a novelist who is Catholic, I'm not a Catholic novelist, i.e. I'm not sitting down to write a novel that makes this or that Catholic point. I'm Catholic, I'm interested in it, it takes up my life, it's gonna come up in my work. I'm going to talk about things that interest me as a Catholic, and in that sense, I'm gonna produce a Catholic novel. The kind of criticism theoretical criticism I'm complaining about says it's the job of the novelist or it says the novelist can't help it even if he wants to to express a certain ideology or a certain political direction. Uh, you said hermeneutic. Hermeneutic just means interpretive. I, I did, uh, hermeneutics is just the art of interpretation, the science of it. And, uh, it's gotten to be associated with a, the, the term, I think, has been taken up largely by Gadamer and his, his school. And, and they're sort of drawing on, on um, Husserl and, and the whole phenomenological thing. But in its very strict, simple sense, it's just interpretation. It, it sounds a lot fancier than interpretation, of course, because it's Greek, uh, and that always helps. Uh, but, so I, the, 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 but the theory I'm talking about, the is, is the kind of, uh, that starts off with the theory and, and only takes up the work of fiction later to make it fit into the theory. So, so would you say then that uh, now you would recommend for Catholics who want to write that they shouldn't, the aim is not rhetoric, but what Jacques Maritain would say is the virtue of art but expressed through uh, uh, write the best novel you execution. can first right. and, and hope that the rest of it takes care of itself. Uh, obviously, you're going to write uh, fiction or poetry or whatever that, well, not obviously. The chances are you're going to write fiction or poetry that tends to be moral or religious or Catholic or whatever. Uh, more so if your own life is steeped in the faith, in the practice of it, in, in devotion, and so on. You can't count on that. Uh, it usually works, I think, but not always. Uh, I, my, my feeling is that as 
Graham Greene got to be worse and worse and worse a Catholic, his fiction got worse and worse and worse. But uh, I don't think I'm prejudiced in that. I mean, would anybody want to read, what is it, the Monsignor Quixote instead of The Heart of the Matter? I don't think so. That's uh, a lady in the back. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to pick up on one of just the last thing, one of the last things you said, which was that a novel is a particular, um, it's a concrete exemplum, which I, I mean, I find kind of an interesting, um, yeah, description. Um, you know, in philosophy, we're kind of always dealing with the particular and the universal, and how do they relate to each other, and do they relate to each other, and um, yeah. Uh, and what that relation looks like. So it seems to me that in today's world, we might say we, we've kind of lost both the particular and the universal at times, right? Like what the particular actually means, right? But also that um, the particular rules, my subjective experience, so, you know, for example, is the truth, right? For me, that's when I'm true to myself. So my particular becomes the universal, right, against which I have to sort of measure anybody else. Um, and then we can't really communicate because there is no universal. So it, it's interesting to me that you, you uh, described a novel as a particular um, because it, it's, it also seems to me to be one of the problems that sort of your reviewers that you were critiquing fall into those subscribers of the various isms, right? They're trying to take a novel and make it into this universal, right? Um, or fit into their universal scheme. And yet at the same time, the universal that they're talking about is kind of actually particular to them. So just to get to my question, I was just wondering if you thought that the novel and art in general, and maybe something specific about the novel um, is a, a concrete sort of mediation between what's particular and what's universal, right? Because you 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 described it as a particular or a concrete example, and yet, right, a proper critique of a novel would sort of draw, be able to draw universals out of it. So I just, if you had any comments about that, I would love to hear them. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> I could stop there. <laughs> Uh, no, I, you, you've given, I think, a, a nice account of what I've been trying to say. Uh, it's a novel is a way of talking about ideas, and I've already fallen into the, the wrong phrase by saying talking about, though we talk about, we're talking about it now. Uh, it's a way of our talking about ideas with a particular image or dramatization, uh, something specific to focus on to use in an exemplary fashion. Uh, it, it does indeed deal with universal notions. I, I talked about grace, about you know, the fate of individual human beings, about the place of each man and woman in the scheme of things. But the novel, instead of giving an account of these, uh, you know, the ultimate way is, you know, say the Summa Theologiae. Uh, instead of doing that, it talks about uh, Julia and Sebastian and Charles and uh, Lord Marchmain and, and Rex and all of these people. But because they're not people we actually know, because they're living in a, they're, they're not in the same place we are, because we don't have a personal stake in what they're doing, that's the point of the disinterest, we can see it in a more detached way and see ourselves better for it. I suppose the hardest thing for uh, human beings is to, uh, well, you said it yourself in what you, you just pointed out about uh, the truth is my truth, what I feel. You know, the hardest thing for us to do is to escape from what Hopkins calls our, our narrow sweating selves. Uh, we, we, are, we get caught up in ourselves. Um, the, I think that literature is important for education for that very reason. Um, I've, over the last oh, 10 or 20 years or so, I've become a kind of bore about this. Every time I get a chance, I remind people of the etymology of education which is to draw out. And my idea is that 
education is intended to draw the student out of himself, to get him out of that narrow little self-centered narcissistic world that as uh, sinful little monsters we tend to live in. Uh, and it does that, of course, by making us see things. I mean, Hamlet says this, you know, it holds up a mirror as it were to nature. What it does is it holds up a mirror to ourselves. Am I acting like King Claudius now? Charles didn't want to act like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Uh, that's a simplified way of putting it, but I, I think the point is there. I have found, and I think many, many others that I know, and I think students who seem to have benefited from my classes have found that reading poems and fiction and drama makes you know yourself better because in evaluating the characters and their actions in these fictitious works, you end up evaluating yourself. You inevitably try to put yourself in that story in some sense or other. I can yell. My question involves kind of what we're touching on, which is the virtues of a novelist. So the excellences, what, like what we're describing right now, is that someone is able to move beyond themselves as a novelist. What other virtues would you say that a novelist has to have in order to write well? <sighs> See, <laughs> well, first he has to be able to write well. Um, and so the first thing, the, the, the first requirement for being a novelist is being a writer and being able to write well. And to be able to write well, you need to be able to read well. And to be able to read well, you need to read a great deal. Uh, perhaps the easiest way for me to do this would be to say, what I would give for advice if someone came to me, and every now and then someone has. It's a sort of an occupational hazard. Um, people will come into English teachers and say, I've got this novel I've written. This is why I'm glad they invented creative writing courses. They, they mostly leave me alone now. It's, uh, but I do have students come and ask, and uh, I say, well, the first thing you need to do is read a great deal. Read as carefully as you can. And read, don't just skim. Don't just thumb through it and think, oh, I got the idea. Look up the words you don't know. I don't know how it goes here, but I had, I had I'm, I'm spared that now. Um, but I had uh, many students who were astounded when I said, you know, they do, sorry, would do badly on a quiz. And I'd say, well, you didn't understand what it said here. You didn't know the meaning of the word. Oh, I didn't know what that word meant. I said, did you look it up? Uh, was I supposed to do it? You didn't tell us to. Right? So, <laughs> so I'm telling you to. Uh, <laughs> that's my first thing. Read a lot. Second, learn at least one foreign language well enough to read it. Preferably learn two. Read them a great deal. Read them as well as you can. Then start writing and write a great deal. Start with just expository prose. Learn to use the language well. Read a lot of things besides just fiction or poetry or what you want to write. Know about history. Know about other arts. Uh, get an acquaintance with the world. And uh, take a creative writing course because you can network that way. <laughs> If you're going to write poetry, learn to write verse. I mean, real verse with you know meter and rhyme and that sort of thing. You might write really fine free verse ultimately, but learn how to write verse. If you're writing fiction, learn how to tell a straightforward story straight through before you start fiddling around with stream of consciousness or a literary montage effect or that kind of thing. So, so the virtues are virtues of uh, just being able to write. And then, of course, there's that thing called talent, which is a gift. Uh, and you may just get one, and you shouldn't bury that. But if you get 10, really invest it and work hard with it. <laughs>
I mean, that's what I'm talking about, the virtues of the novelist, the poet, the playwright person. If you're going to be a playwright, learn about the theater. Learn about stage settings. Learn about entrances and exits. I mean, that, that kind of thing. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Professor Young, for a delightful lecture. Thank you. Yeah.